Far east of the Sword Coast, the Shadowvar and Discoverin have fallen. The Shadow Storm is no more. Zembia is fractured into city-states. A mysterious hero rises from the ashes to usher in a new era of prosperity. Yet there is still suffering. Cormir and the wild elves of the Dale Lands offer war on all sides. Earth motes, madness, and shadow dragons plague the lands. These are the tales of the heroes who ended that suffering. 1491 DR, the year of Sembian revival. All right, everyone, welcome to the next and possibly final episode of The Long Winded One. With me tonight, I'm very humbled to have a very special guest named Ed Greenwood with me. And Ed is the father, um, or rather, Arc Mage of Forgotten Realms. He has been reading and writing fantasy and other genres <laughs> since he was very young. And he sold his his world of Forgotten Realms to TSR um, for the paltry sum of $5,000 or so back uh, many years ago um, in exchange for bringing the realms to D&D so that thousands of people could play in his world. And to, as he says, to get fancy maps. He has uh, retained the rights to write and create in his world just as long as Wizards of the Coast continue to publish material in that world. This, of course, was the probably quickest of introductions to a man who is humble and passionate um, and, of course, an icon for the role-playing game community. Um, if you want the true uh, 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 tr an introduction that does him justice, please go to the Archivos uh, podcast where they do a a 10 minute version uh, of Ed and, and really they could have gone longer than that. But I just want to welcome you to the podcast, Ed. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm just a gamer who wouldn't go away. <laughs> uh, well, I, I know that, that we all um, thank our stars for that. So, <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> um, well, so the, the reason I invited you tonight uh, um, and what you know um, is to talk about Sambia. Um, we are ending uh, a 50 episode run of a story that's set in Symbia. Um, so I, I want to just point everyone, you have um, probably, I, I think it's over 30 podcasts uh, where you've done interviews over the years. I think the earliest one I found was from 2010, but I know that you did some in, uh, before that. And um, I, some of my favorites, of course, were the archivos that I just mentioned, but, but one of my other favorites was the plot points interview. Um, mm -hmm. where you talked about the the details of, of your sale of Forgotten Realms. Um, so I just want to point people to those. Um, you can go learn all about Ed and, and, and how he created the world. But getting specifically into Symbia. So, so uh, my first question. So Symbia was a world that was created for Dungeon Masters. But tell us, was, was Symbia on your first Forgotten Realms maps? And, and how much of her history did you already have in your head when the edict went out to, you know, leave it open for Dungeon Masters? Well, Sembia was part of the realms from the beginning. So it's, it's on the maps with all of the cities and most of the towns and villages that, that you know now. Um, but I warned Jeff, Jeff Grubb, okay, uh, just take a step back for a moment. Sure. The, the old gray box, FR0. I have it here with me. Yeah, I, yep. I ordered it actually um, again because I wanted to see this. I have these huge maps, these huge, beautiful maps <laughs> that you talk about. Yep. Well, it was a, it was basically the product of three people. Karen Boomgarden, who was then Karen S. Martin and is now Karen Conlon. And you can find her online. She She has her own editing thing. Highly recommended, by the way, um, Grammar Geddon. Um, and she was the editrix putting the book together. And Jeff Grubb, TSR designer, was the designer at TSR who was helming the project and uh, taking the notes of me, the eccentric Canadian dungeon master and storyteller, <laughs> and turning them into game rules for the time. Um, I, Jeff had written the original position paper about, you know, proposal for a unified game world for the second edition of the game. Um, and so he was 
they put the B on him to get me and the and the realms. But as it happens, the realms was beating second edition into print by a little bit. So as Jeff and I were putting it together, he was doing the putting together with Karen. And I was doing the use TSR's FedEx account to send weekly packages. <laughs> um, this is all done by hand in those days. Yeah, the double know. bubble wraps. Is yep, that, yep. Yeah. Uh, I was sending them off, all these packages. And Jeff would say, could I have something on battlefields? Could I have something on cities? Uh, what have you got on this? What do you got on that? Because he was building the box set. And I warned Jeff right at the beginning that Sembia was the land of fat, rich merchants. Mm -hmm. That's the cut line. Sembia is the land of fat, rich merchants. And therefore, it has lots of big cities, lots of important moneyed movers and shakers, so lots of NPCs to write up, and would consume gobs of word count. And remember, this is pre-pixel days, so that really mattered back then. So as we had both agreed as, as game designers that one area should be left blank for dungeon masters to fill in themselves, Jeff chose Sembia. And he later wished he'd chosen somewhere more distant from our early game and fiction <laughs> releases because Sembia was sitting right there and it was this sort of white cloud at the edge of the map that, you know, if you fled Cormier like, like all those Bugs Bunny Roadrunner cartoons, or Pink Panzer, you know, and you were running along the road, you'd come to the edge, and the moment you realized there was no road under your feet, you'd start falling, just like in the yeah. cartoons, <laughs> because Sembia was a big open white hole. So that was Jeff's regret. Me, I was thinking, um, Jeff, if you just let me do the realms my way, and I didn't mean I had anything against what Jeff was doing. What I really meant was, could you somehow overrule your bosses and <laughs> all the people who run the company? Because this box set, I need a leather slip case with 20 box sets, one for Sambia, one for Cormier. <laughs> yeah. And, and we all wish we could have gotten that. Right? Yeah. But of course, they were, you know, wondering if this world would just go plop and they'd have to vanish, which is why I wrote the contract up the or pushed for the contract to be done the way it was because i was afraid they would stop publishing it after a year and i'd never get it back you know which which was a real possibility uh until it started selling Ta-da! <laughs> and which is why you're talking to me today so many years later and the rest as they say is, is history, history. <laughs> <laughs> well let's let's do the next question here so despite there not being many things for a dungeon master or a writer to pull from from about the history of symbia i mean there, there are things out there of course you can find them uh, what are the unofficial sources that you would recommend uh, to when you're planning a campaign? Um, but, but is there a, like a wiki or would you suggest, you know, Candlekeep? Yeah, I've given a lot of answers at Candlekeep over the years and more recently on Twitter, um, you know, to people's questions about Sembia. And uh, I'm afraid Watsy just pulled the plug on their archive server. So much mm. for honoring contracts, guys. <clears throat> uh, oh. But... Uh, and so therefore you have to go to the Wayback Machine. Yeah. But if you type in Realms Lore, the flourishing career of Melvo's Hammerstars, that's a long article series I did on the Watsi website, which just looks over the shoulder of one Sembian merchant and gives you a, an idea about how the society works. Hmm. I, I also did another Realms Lore called The Matchmaker of Sembia which gave a shorter look. And then there were at least uh, two um, Rand's travelogues, caravans and trading companies in Sembia and more old empires in Sembia. And the Rand's travelogues, little known secret, they were outtakes from the third edition FRCS, the big, gorgeous, beige hardcover book. Yeah. S stuff that had to be trimmed out. Um, people on staff in house took those cutting room floor things and re recut them and sized them into articles by topic. Um, also, uh, I don't know. I know I'm covering official stuff here. The Forgotten Realms Adventures tome covers all the cities of Sembia in the 1350s DR, and it's good up until 1385 DR. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, the first and second edition box sets, the FRCS tome, and the 4E FRCS, they all have coverage of Sembia. Polyhedron, 
uh, 94, Land of Merchants, and Cult of the Dragon, pages 33 and 34, also covered um, Sambia or mentioned Sambia and delved into bits. And of course, yes, I would recommend the Candlekeep forums. They're still active, not nearly as much as they once were. And doing a, doing a Sambia search there, as you probably know, will pull up yeah. a lot of references. But what we didn't ever get was a proper Sembia source book. And that's one thing I'd like to do some in some year um, if I live long enough. And I'm, and I mean, I'm not being flippant. There are so many things I want to cover in the realms that if I live long enough is now a real concern. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you have to do what you get the chance to do and hope that you can get them done in a hurry. Well, let's 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 ask about the guys that have helped you through this and yeah. archive some of this lore and um, people who who might help you do that someday. Um, mm -hmm. but could you tell us a little bit about your lore lords? Sure. Okay. So let's start with Ian, the last one, because Ian was the first one. Uh, Ian Hunter. Uh, there are two Hunter brothers, John and Ian. John was Florin Falconhand. Okay. Ian was Lancerl Snowmantle, the druid. Uh, Ian was also the original lore lord of the realms. He was one of my home realms campaign players and won two realms trivia contests that I did at Christmas get-togethers for my own group. Every year, Ian would win, so he won the title of lore lord, mainly because he had a steel trap memory. He's the guy who'd say, oh yeah, the name of that innkeeper that we met once was, you know, Okay, so he would win the contest. So he's my original lore lord. But he also started to think of the realms in the same way I did. So in the downtime between uh, adventures for the, the characters, he would say, my druid is going to go and do this. Hmm. And he would write me little um, notes and letters. So he was thinking of the realms as a real place with ongoing uh, life, not just the player characters bringing it to life um so he was our first lower lord then there's two friends of mine um and here's where your list is a little wrong you say eric logan okay eric logan boyd is one person <laughs> ah got you got okay? you and george Crashos is another person and they're good friends and they often work as a team even though eric is based near ann arbor in michigan and George is based in Southern Australia, near Adelaide. Got you. So for years, the two of them have worked together to create New Realms lore. And their jam is to take inconsistencies in published Realms lore, whether it's articles in the Dragon and Dungeon and official products or adventures, and just explain away these inconsistencies, not by saying X is clearly wrong, but by saying, well, the real reason there are two different people called the Wizard of Zoblob is because, and then he, they concoct a whole new story which adds Realms lore to us. And both of them consult with me like every two or three days. I get an email. And, and um, for one thing, um, they are building lexicons of all of the fantasy languages in the realms as we add phrases and words and other and anybody working in the realms whether it's the uh aaron evans adding draconic on top of the draconic that that owen stevens and others did adding to the draconic that i did adding to you know it, they just slowly build them um will those, and, will those be public um eventually i hope so but that's really up to george because he's done most of the compilation work so although uh, in effect, Wizards owns them because they're all stuff from published realms lore, except, mm -hmm. you know, answers I've given him that he's added. And sometimes he'll say, if X means tree and Y means branch, what do you think about Z or Z for twig? And I'll go, yeah, or, but that'll conflict with, ah, okay, and we, we adjust it. So he's, he's coined words, Eric's coined words, I've coined words, and Brian Cortio, and that's our next lore lord, Brian Cortio, who um, lives near New York, um, and he adopted Cormier as the love of his life. 
and mm -hmm. he became the expert on Cormier. By the way, there is a huge long article that he and I and Eric and George and Brian Wishstat and Tom Costa and some others have worked on for the years developing called the Royal Lineage of Cormier, mm -hmm. which gives every single monarch of Cormier and their relatives and their pretenders and their bastards and everybody around them who tried to usurp or the, whatever the throne. And it tells the story of Cormier all the way through. And it's never been published for the very good reason that um, TSR and later Watsi did not want um, their hands tied for telling new stories. Especially in Cormier, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number one. Number two, because the royal lineage of Cormier is probably, if you if you printed it the way we now do, say, fifth edition source books, we're talking about a <laughs> two thousand page source book. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I've seen lineages of Cormier that are you know from Alisair down to uh, Riedra, um, it, when that it already takes two pages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could have used that source so much, Ed. I, I was planning, my last campaign was in Cormier. And, um, you know, I read all of the Cormier novels, including the first that you, I believe you wrote the first and the third, um, or helped write the third. Um, yes. And then I even read um, Aaron Evans. Um, uh, Brimstone Tiefling. Angels. Yeah. yeah that, that was set in Cormier. Yes. Yeah. Brian helped with all of those. And I helped with all of those. Um, just making, because Aaron likes to get her lore right. So whenever she wasn't sure about something, She'd quiz both of us separately hmm. and get answers back. And uh, which, I mean, I love Erin as a writer. I think she's a superb writer and I love the way she do, does things creatively. Um, and I was really tickled pink with the results of all those. But anyway, uh, yes, um, uh, <clears throat> I should shut up now because I will drag us so far off tangent. Uh, remember Semvia? We were oh, going to talk about Semvia. You know, I gosh, the, the, my most recent campaign was actually Cormier, so I'm going down a path too with you. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe if there's a season five on Cormier, I can have you back, and we'll we'll go sure. Over that. Um, uh, anyway, so I I do have another question, um, and it's about you know it, it's about we we've talked about the timeline at least a little bit and dipped our toe in that, and I've heard you say in the past, you know. The, the timeline that, that WotC is kind of taking uh, the realms on is, is, is just happening so fast. And I've heard you say something like, I, slow down, slow down. I'm not yet, I'm not done filling in the world. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and what I'm wondering is if, if we're ever going to get to a point um, where I think maybe Disney got with, you know, Star Wars or, or how, however you want to explain it. But will, will there ever be a, a point at which you say, okay, we're going to do um, like an expanded universe or like a legends. And then here's where the timeline splits. And this is, you know, Ed's version of forgotten realms. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. It makes sense. Uh, whether it ever happens, that's entirely up to wizards. They own the copyright. Now they control what gets published. And in, in some ways they have already done that in that they jump forward a hundred years in fourth edition. And, um, that means you don't have to worry about reading the older material and checking everything because, oh, if you if you called somebody else king of such a place, well, obviously during that hundred years, you know, somebody died and somebody else took over. Da, 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 da. And of course, that conveniently forgets that there are longstanding um, continual lines of rulership, like in Cormir, and you have to fill in the gap, at least for Cormier, which we did in Backdrop Cormier, that article um, that, that Brian Cortijo wrote, or, and Brian James. Um, and they both were working together on, on the background lore. Uh, because you can't just have a hundred-year gap, even if you want to. And yeah. I think it would be a mistake, because the rich, deep accumulation of the lore in the realms, despite... The headaches it can give designers or fiction writers who are unfamiliar with the setting it's the great feature of the setting and it's almost unmatched among fantasy worlds just because we've been at it for so long with so many cooks um only middle earth comes close right in terms of lore piled up so it's a feature not a bug and it would be a pity to throw away a strength and benefit 
for purposes of, let's face it, lazy convenience. Well, I just, I, you know, I, I always wondered, like, I've heard you talk about what, what, what the Moonshay Isles uh, several mm-hmm. times. And, and I thought, you know, I, I know what happened with the Moonshay Isles. They had, they, had, they had an idea for a set of islands and they kind of, you, you had your version of the islands and they had theirs and, and you know, the publishers went with their idea. And, and so I, I, I kind of thought, you know, I bet Ed... <laughs> I bet Ed has been playing with his version of the moon chase for 30 years. Of course and, he has. Yeah. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if there'll ever be a point where it's like, okay, we're, we're starting back at, you know, you know, DR zero or even before. And it's like, okay, this is going to be version six from the beginning, you know, Ed's version. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Know? But, but if, if I was doing that, it wouldn't be published, yeah. you know? Um, but, uh, no, the you see the thing about the Moonshays is uh, TSR UK was going to have its own publishing line, right? And uh, we did indeed see Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh and stuff like that, but um, they were going to have their own world too. And Doug Niles, who was in a staff designer at TSR, had written his own sort of fantasy England or Albion, is what he called it. And what sure. they did is they had this detailed world and he had a couple novels um that he was one mainly finished and one just started and outlined and they needed launch products for the realms because they were deathly afraid that if the realms came out one tiny product at a time it would die on the vine it had to come out with a huge rush and excite people and have tons of products and they could get game products from all the stuff i was sending them and plus setting all of their staff designers to work doing stuff, but they wanted a novel and they wanted a novel fast. And I was told to write a novel that would show us the realms, which became Spellfire, although they cut it to less than a third of what I wrote in order to get it on the schedule, in order to get it to the length. Uh, they had discovered a new writer. That was Bob Salvatore. Mm-hmm. Um, so Crystal Shard, but they needed a novel fast well doug had this finished novel dark walker on moonshay okay guess what we're sinking ed's moonshays and putting and and jeff grubb called me and said do you mind i said i don't mind at all it's your world you could do anything you want with it um and then here's the thing my original moonshays were like the hebrides like ursula Le Guin's earth sea they were mm-hmm. lots of little islands and fisher folk got in these tiny rickety fishing boats and went from island to island so in some ways it was more interesting to me than the sort of uh fantasy version of england that doug was spinning but doug's version is incredibly interesting too and it's new to me it's not from my own imagination so i was just as happy with it but you can see how it didn't quite fit the original you know we have we don't have Shanti. We have the Earth Mother, who's really Shanti, or is she? Yeah. You know, it was sort of like uneasily welded on. And and that's okay. I mean, TSR had bought the realms and told me up front, they were going to do this, you know, because we need a jungle campaign. We need a Arabian campaign. We need an Oriental campaign. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think you're following in good footsteps. You know, Tolkien had his Atlantis, right, in Numenor. And right. now you have your England and your Forgotten for yeah, Realms. There sure. you go. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you touched a little bit on, yeah, you, you mentioned novels and um, Bob Salvatore, who <laughs> lives about 15 minutes away from me. Uh, he's, Got it. He lives, he lives oh, in, in, uh, in Worcester. Yeah. 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 He lives in Lemonster, I believe, doesn't he? Or has yes. he moved to Worcester? Yes. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Um, and I was I was in Barnes and Noble in Lemonster last weekend, and they didn't have an R. A. Salvatore book in in the Barnes and Noble. I couldn't believe it. I, I almost went to talk to someone. <laughs> you should I, before I know. Bob does. No, <laughs> I I know. <laughs> well, okay, uh, this time of year, Bob is on the other coast. Ah, uh, so that's maybe why they can dare to do it, because they know uh, he won't come storming through the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, speaking of novels, so I, I, I'm skipping out of order here in the questions just because it makes sense from what you were talking about here. I, I want to know about the, you know, your, the process in writing uh, Halls of Storm Weather. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us about your experience preparing and writing that first short story, which I remember so vividly. Um, 
And, and, and part two to that question, which I'll repeat again, if you need me to, um, did all of the characters turn out the way you had envisioned them, particularly Tamlin and Erebus? Ah, well, here you go. <laughs> um, that was a project that was hatched in the house by TSR's book department. And Phil Athens, you know, corresponded with me and he said, okay, um, we want to do this family saga and each character will get their own book. And in the end, um, I didn't write my book at the end of the things because by then they had canceled the series. Um, but up until then, uh, they were going to pull together different books by different authors, both in-house and freelance, and each was going to get one character. And he said, what have you got um, done up? And I said, well, I have family trees for a whole bunch of them, but what? And he said, well, no, no, what do you have for the storm weathers? And I said, I can only tell you the names of two of them because that's not one of the detailed ones. He says, good, because that's the, the name that we like, and I've drawn up a... <laughs> And so the characters are basically his hmm. and, and I had a very thin paragraph for each, like the disapproving father, <sighs> you know, um, uh, young rebel, uh, young rebellious son, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. And, and one of them's got a dark secret that they're, they're going to be, Oh, okay. But you're not going to tell me what it is. Okay. I'll tell you, but I don't want you to mention it in the story. <sighs> okay. The story is to introduce all the characters on stage and tell us how we got there. Not just um, how they became the way they are, but how their family and their family's position in Sambia. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be an in the past story, in the recent past. Um, and it's going to set the stage for the entire series. So I wrote it up and I, and I wrote up detailed write-ups for all the characters not game stats but this is how they strike the eye this is what their um characters are in terms of mannerism speech whatever but i still want them to be as much blank slates as you need them to be to tell your own stories and take them in different directions what this is doing is summarizing the way i'm going to show them in the snapshot of the short story so this is your ground zero, your session zero, your starting point. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, and I'm going to deliberately step sideways here and give you an incongruous um, comparison. It's like you're watching the first episode of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> and, you know, on comes, I, I, I know we shouldn't sing because we have to pay royalties. So I will not sing this, even though I can sing it just fine. I'm going to tell you all a story about a man named Jed. And then he tells the story and you see granny in the rocking chair. And then you get the eating credits with Jethro coming in and all that stuff. And that's basically all the short story is other than yeah. to build in the past and the feuds that this family's involved in, and then just leave it for everybody to take their characters on their own. So, I had no expectations for how the characters would turn out other than I want to see what they do with them in their novels. So for me, it was just like pure entertainment because I got to introduce them all and then somebody else took them over so they could come alive right in front of me, which is the one thing a world that you create cannot do is surprise you right. because you're the creator. You're, do you're like, if somebody walks and talks a character, that's because you created them and you made them walk and talk. But if somebody else takes it over, then you can just sit back and watch the fun. The character has come to life in front of you. Let's watch what happens. So that's what there. There's no like either disappointment or whatever for me. It's uh, let's see what they do. Ooh. <laughs> sure. And did you um, did you have any inkling um, about how you know how big Erebus Kale would become? No. Um, but. Uh, very early on, I could see that Paul Kemp, who, you know, by the way, is a lawyer in Michigan. Okay. You know, a very smart guy and a very nice guy. I could see that he had writing chops that could handle a character, uh, um, 
this is going to be a spoiler for anybody who hasn't read them, but um, you can deal with the divine as well as the mortal mm-hmm. and great power and make it work and make it seem realistic as opposed to um, the cartoon version of all the Greek and Roman gods um, that we may have grown up with um, in various media. You know, with it sort of say, oh, they're superhumans. They have big jaws that wag largely. They have mighty thews that glisten mightily. And they leap from tall buildings to tall mountain tops. Blah! You know, and it's sort of like, okay, they're, they're like, we get it. They're overblown. Um, but they somehow don't seem real because of that. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, Tolkien, for instance, could have a big bad evil that never comes on stage, but and yet you're going whoa, because he writes of the effects so powerfully, mm-hmm. you know. And and um, I I could see that what Paul was giving us was writing that was that strong in that direction. So no, you know, the the. The reading public with their wallets decides what they're going to do more of, you know, what the publisher is going to give you more of. But uh, you could see that early on when the when the when the books were coming out. Oh, this is something interesting. Let's see Mm. where this goes. Well, can I can I ask about that? Can I can I I've asked um, Phil and, and some of the other authors but you know they they basically discontinued the novel line except for some you know Aaron Evans and uh, R.A. Salvatore novels. Did do you think they'll ever come back to Symbio or or let these authors finish the stories that the the trilogies that they started and never got to finish, such as you know the Godborn, which was another supposed to be another trilogy. Uh, I don't know that, and that's up to wizards. But I can tell you. Um, that Brian Thompson, who was the head of the book department, when TSR got um, officially merged, but it was really a takeover, by Wizards of the Coast, he said, okay, that's it. We're all on borrowed time. Hasbro does not publish fiction. Meaning they're going to get rid of the book department. And it was a, a rear guard fighting action from them because i wanted to see the young dragons that's aaron evans eric scott to be rosemary jones etc james p davis etc etc that they just sort of brought on board some of whom had given us great books and were going to give us more i didn't want to see them just like chop that's it thanks thanks for coming fellas you know i didn't want that to you know because i didn't a i didn't think that was fair and b i thought you're turning your backs on so many good stories. We could yeah. have, you know, years of brilliant stories. I mean, you read City of the Dead by Rosemary Jones. You read The God um, Catcher by Aaron Evans and her Brimstone Angel stuff. You read Down Shadow by Eric Scott to be. These are delightful books to read, period. You know, I want to see more of them. But the only way right now for fiction to be published you can put a few paragraphs inside a game thing if you're publishing it at DMs Guild, but you can't publish fiction. Do you think they'd let a podcaster maybe get uh, get away with letting John Pruden say a paragraph of uh, a short story that came from Dragon? I hope so. <laughs> uh, okay. There are copyright laws about how you can quote because sure. there are academic quotations and there's a fair use there. Yeah, there's very few words that we included in that. Yeah, uh, it, then you're that probably okay. Yeah, uh, in the same way that we can all steal lines that are become famous quotations, you know, the 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 one or two lines from a yeah. novel, um, and that's okay. That that's considered fair use. But I don't. You see, the the novels that are being published now are because an outside third party, like for Bob's novels, Harper Collins, because you haven't editor there who's a fan of Drizzt and wants new Drizzt books, they bring a business proposal to Hasbro and say, hey, is it okay if, and then Wizards of the Coast is working out the business terms, and what it really means is most of the money, because it has to be split between Wizards of the Coast and the publisher, so they're going to take a huge bath compared to publishing somebody else's fantasy novel, 
Um, it really comes down to, do they want to do that? And if the answer is yes, um, then it will probably happen. You, you're, you're about to see a new Dragonlance book from Margaret and Tracy, the beginning wow. of a trilogy. Wow. Uh, that'll be this coming summer, I think. Well, I, I wanted to, I wanted to sort of delve back into the three questions that are specific to Symbia. Um, and, and we can, you know, talk about these as long as you want, but I, I without, without mentioning, you know, specific communities, um, I wanted to ask about the Redwater Meadow. Um, so I've been, um, I've known uh, Liam from Liam, Liam's Lyceum. Um, he, he's kind of reading all of the Realms novels and we've been talking about it. We were both curious about some of those communities and, and, and sort of how that Redwater Meadow came about. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Okay. The Meadow of Redwater, <laughs> otherwise known as Redwater Meadow, is named that because it's a vast, wading shallow, cranberry bog oh. it's huge and it's said to have an ancient giant king's tomb under it a flooded flooded underground labyrinth full of treasure that's been co-opted by a dragon or a giant octopus or other watery menace that tales differ wildly um for its lair since um the uh king was um interred there but it remains that that underground labyrinth is under the water somewhere cranberries are harvested seasonally the bog is fed by local streams and the insects the stinging insects the insects up your nose and in your ears and in your eyes keep any settlement from being established nearby brigands have traditionally fled to this uninhabited thorn vine choked area and established hideouts here during the summers. Hmm. So that's where the meadow of red water comes from. Boy, that would have changed my story quite a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> no, no, that's great. You know, and I did a series of uh, anytime I interviewed an expert about Tolkien, I said, okay, here's what my story said. Tell me why I'm, tell me why I'm either right or wrong. Go. And um, I, I actually really like to hear that. Um, because it, I think it, um, it also gives the listener who have listened to the whole story kind of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, um, can I ask more specifically about Coral's Well? Coral's Well, the headwaters of the River Lurlar, a bucolic farming village, lots of sheep and goat ranching in rolling hills country with lots of scrub vegetation like natural berry bushes, gooseberries, blackberries, strawberries, and small all consumed locally vegetable plots lots of marrows grow um Coralswell exports lamb goat and goat's cheese hmm. um Coralswell is home to about 400 folk but the village center is home to just under 120 the rest are all outlying farmers it's ruled by a council of six uh local mirror uh, miller the wealthiest merchants answer tolsterk a many goods importer and seller like he runs the local um, corner store or um, dry goods store or everything store. Um, a retired caravan merchant who's seen a lot of the heartlands, and her name is Avrantha Brantrees. She now owns and runs a crew that makes and fixes bridges and roads locally, and she makes local big items, uh, shipments uh, on her wagons. So, I mean, if you order furniture from somewhere, or if you need something in bulk, like piles of firewood, hmm. she'll bring it. Uh, and there's also on this council, the, rounding out the council six, the local cleric of Shanti, the local cleric of Mailiki, and the local cleric of the Thander. The farmers of Coralswell have ongoing problems with wolves and foxes and the occasional lucrata, but on rare occasions have to deal with something more sinister. Hmm. And Antath Coral was the early settler centuries ago who cleaned out and lined with stone hence well corals well uh the spring welling to the surface here that becomes the lurlar there are still corals in sembia most living near yon and in selgon uh -huh. uh, gotcha boy that would have changed, that would have changed the story quite a bit too and i this is great this is great stuff uh truly truly uh and in our story um, it was named for a 
a very long-lived druid who was a little bit eccentric, and he had crafted an artifact named the Coral Seed, which um, which would, er if planted, would erupt into imagine a um, a great explosion of a fifty-mile-wide jungle that suddenly created. <laughs> that sounds far cooler than what I came up with. So yeah, run with it. No, so so I, I do have a question about uh, two questions. Um, they, they they could be quick. What year are we talking about when, when you when you were talking in present tests? Uh, right now I'm talking the around 1479 in there. Gotcha. I, um, I was wondering if you were kind of in the five E timeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I'm these days uh, because that's what wizard wants me to provide lore for for them that's my go-to unless somebody says okay the year is 1357 go, go you yeah. know unless somebody specifies something i i work in the current timeline because that's what wizards needs most of the time sure sure yeah no i i just uh, i think our listeners are probably also going to want to know okay these people that he's referencing you know when is now? <laughs> yeah, will, yeah, right. When will then be now? Soon. Yeah, soon. <laughs> uh, so, and the other question I had was: it, it, at times, it sounded like you were reading for some, from something. Was this was this a a supplement, a resource, or uh, something um, that you had written up privately? Oh, I have no, I have notes on everything. So what I did um, was pull my notes on on Sembia, and oh yeah, I've got that covered. Oh yeah, I got this covered. Oh, that's so great. Uh, if you want to know all about Jarlil or Nolan or Seaspring, yeah, I got you covered. Two places that that um, became a part of our story, uh, Jarlil, which which we mistakenly called Jarlil. Um, so Jarlil became a an earth moat in our story um, and became a kind of a catalyst for one of our characters developing. And, and Nolan became a... Um, it was referred to, we never went to Nolan, but um, it was referred to as the home of some, a group called the Freedom Fighters. Um, because what I had envisioned was that Symbia was, especially this far to, to the west of Selgant or, uh, or Doolin, was, you know, really kind of not Symbian, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yep, yep. Um, where, you know, maybe the maybe the Shadowvar and, and Uskevrin um, back in the day, or, or even the current ruler um, was trying to exert their influence, both, you know, financially and politically, but, but they were kind of, you know, the, the people there didn't really, they like a militia. They didn't really want to be ruled. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That, that fits. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think the way I was seeing this, this area is they largely want to be left alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, Jarlil, a town on the river Lurlar that stands atop a hard walk rock promontory. Now you just look at the map. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a plug of hard rock or the river wouldn't go around it. It would have cut through it years ago. Well, we one of our characters, Siren, who moved there from Westgate and became a, a merchant, um, a lowly merchant, not a merchant noble, of course, um, we talked about him going cliff diving at one point. Would that, would that have possibly been accurate? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's Charlie is up on top of a hard rock promontory, which is locally rumored to have rich veins of ore in it. Now, um, maybe there's some left right now. It's riddled with old worked out iron mines and a few natural caverns, which of course are said to connect to dangerous deep caverns in the underdark and Ooh. they have certainly harbored various monsters over the years that likely quote came up from below unquote although there's no tradition of drow raiding bands or anything coming up from the realms below in force interestingly for almost a century tales have been going around serloon of kulzanath a beholder layering in one of these caves that uses its own undead spawn as guardians small undead beholders Ooh. and it controls a small highly secretive network of human agents operating in the sembian ports smugglers fences and blackmailing the wealthy to arrange low prices for bulk goods that they pay so they can resell those bulk goods for much more elsewhere its goal, both before and after the Thultanthan time, 
was to covertly increase its influence in Sembian politics. It avoids Cormirian entanglements entirely. Mm -hmm. Jarlil itself has always had a small military usefulness as a lookout and signal beacon. There are four separate log cabin pyramids of firewood awaiting the torch, each inside its own stone wall that's far too low to stop sparks whenever they're lit, but do stop animals and carts from knocking the pyramids over. <laughs> um, and for the same reason was a roosting place for hunting dragons in, quote, the wild times. And then later was a meeting place for elves before the coming of the humans. And something of a trap for dragons. If a dragon swooped on the meeting elves, it would be met with slaying spells and later a meeting place for the human settlers, especially when orcs, hobgoblins, and gnolls came raiding. Hmm. This led to it being settled early on. And then the presence of sweet water, by which is meant pleasant, clean, pure drinking water that didn't taste of iron or sulfur or anything else strong tasting that it had been per percolating through, uh, springs rising in it, plus the proximity of the Lurlar to take wastes away and products created locally by barge or raft downriver. So Jarlar, that's J-A-R-L-A-R-R, -A -A -R -R, Jarlar, as the townsfolk are known, have long been artists and weavers and woodcarvers and sculptors in stone, choosing their remote location to be far from war and politics and interruptions. They tend to shun politics. Some scoff at tales of Kulzanath, and others don't like to talk about beholders and are clearly fearful. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Well, remind me to have this conversation before I do the campaign from now on. <laughs> okay, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'll always talk to Ed before the campaign. That's right. Yes. That's right. He can tell you where the bodies are buried and the ones that are yeah. still sticking up. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the listeners don't have to know, but the that's story, true. The storyteller does. Um, and what about what about Nolan? Nolan, a shallow water cramped quarters port on the neck, reached along a wagon road known as the Water Trail. Its remoteness from good roads and comparatively crude facilities has kept it a far a fishing village and a repair center for ships that need new sails, masts, and caulking. And little more. Originally, it was called Nulindrar, N U L I N D R A R, Nulindrar, named after an elf who dwelt in this inlet before the coming of the humans to the area in any numbers. The name became corrupted to Nolan over the years. Uh -huh. it's, it's home to some 80 folk, all told, some of whom are rumored to be fugitives from elsewhere, fallen clerics. Mages, retired brigands, and cultists pursuing dark aims because, hey, that's what cultists do. Um, <laughs> good silverfin and gar catches from the local fisher folk who long ago developed good recipes for sea catch pie. Do you think, yes. uh, would it be okay if I yeah. used our transcript and, and had a, uh, a, a small encyclopedia of, you know, the, just the places you've mentioned sure, uh, and what you've told me of Yevin and, and included it on my website so that, yeah, so that go right ahead. I can even send you this text if you yeah, want that, in that an email. Yeah. I, and I'll, I'll include, instead of asking you here and, and sort of, um, having you rehash what you talked about Yevin, who is one of, uh, who was re referenced quite a bit in my podcast. Um, I will include, um, some information that you gave to me on Twitter about Yevin, if that would be okay. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Great. Well, um, I think the last question I have then, and we can maybe include this too, is, um, so my story is set that's after the Godborn and the way I had envisioned it, um, I read somewhere in a module, um, that, that Tamlin had been, uh, assassinated. Um, and so, so the story is set after that and essentially, these city states in in Sembia, or as I referred to them, um, you know, basically kind of being left on their own, and in, in in you know the aftermath of the Shadow Var and the Maelstrom, and and this this one um, merchant noble from um, his his name was Aldon Talendar um, of the Talendar House. He, he was a, a source of uh, he was a catalyst for the story where he you know he he had developed this. Um, 
kind this mythalar um but he was he was seeking out the source who hadn't actually died had hitched a ride on somebody as they left sakors um and so we had this character sonia who had this 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 second consciousness um uh, inside of her and um and and aldon was seeking this to to put inside of this this makeshift mythalar that he created. I, My question for you was, um, what was really happening in Symbia after the Godborn? And and you could talk about you could talk about you know what happened to Ardulin? Did they rebuild it? Um, or you know what what was the relationship? Or what, whatever you feel like you you can or want to and have time to talk about. You know, you can talk about um, Arkenbridge. You can talk about you know, the, you know, how, how, how were the relationships with Cormier and, and the Dales? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, Sambia and Cormier have always been rivals and they always will be. Yeah. Um, cause they're n next door neighbors. They do things differently. Um, the Sambians, uh, I mean, I don't like real world analogs, um, in the realms. Um, but if you were trying to put this in a real world analog, um, Sambia would be the United States of America um, repudiating the British noble system mm -hmm. after they declare independence. They repudiate it and then they try to copy it as fast as they can. <laughs> and they're capitalists. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But but I mean, but I mean, they say, oh, we don't have a class society. We don't have nobles. And then they, they make themselves into wannabe nobles just as fast as they can, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, the United States of America is the only country that I can think of other than a decadent vest pocket European grand duchy somewhere in which I would meet somebody whose name is Herkimer, Herkimer, Herkimer the <laughs> third. You know, it's just like, Oh, that's so American, you know, <laughs> yeah. meaning, you know, wealthy blue stocking type, you know. Um, so Sambia has the same thing. Uh, but, OK, let's take a step back and go, OK, um, Sultansar has vanished. Their mercenary troops are long gone. Didn't Sultansar crash into Myth Draenor? Yes. Yes, it did. And and I'm sorry, I had something to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I know you were. <laughs> Yes, but I mean, from the point of view of the Sembians, it's gone. You know, it flew away yeah. and it never came back. And then they heard that it was been destroyed. Oh, okay. That's something we don't have to do now because that'll cost money. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing the Sembian. Okay, so, yep. okay, they're going, yeah, they will rebuild Ordulin. Despite their hitherto selfish, me first, my coins foremost, nature sembians suddenly realize they're 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 proud of being sembian mm. and they want to recapture the greatness that was stolen from us so they have come to see the benefits of acting together and it's tempered a little of the selfishness of their pride they now see the value of being sembian rather than assuming it you know they used to think oh we're great because we're sembian Mm -hmm. Well, now they see that, hey, it's a good thing being a Sambian, so, which is a very different thing. Um, Did some of that come from, you know, the the characters that we know from Sayerb, right, where they all, you know, bonded together and, and fought against the shadow? Yes, because uh, Sayerb is firmly Sambian, and a lot of the bureaucrats of the central Sambian government, and we're talking clerks, mild-mannered, you know, a T the tax clerks and the accountants, you know, the minor functionaries of government, um, they fled there when the mercenaries hired by uh, Shade, by Saltanter, started marauding. And mm -hmm. many of them stayed. So it's sort of like your 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 mild-mannered desk clerk grew a pair. <laughs> and not only did, did he do that, he preserved what was Sembian. And because he's part of the central bureaucrats, he could just pretend nothing happened on paper and we're going along as we did do or, uh, your taxes are due, which is a wonderful thing for making people think that, Oh, the country continues. It's business as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Let me, let me look at, um, 
Arch Ar Ar Arkendale. Um, they've always been fiercely independent and prickly difficult folk to deal with. Right. And they like it that way. Um, that's how they keep their independence in their minds. Uh, they resist every, anyone and everybody just out of their everyday nature and habit. Um, you know, the, um, to put it in American terms, don't mess with Texas. You know, yeah. if you take that attitude and you use it sort of like a club in all of your dealings, then people expect it of you and they treat you accordingly. And therefore, it becomes very easy to go on behaving like that because, hey, this is the role I have built for myself. People expect it. It works. Yep. yep. And, of course, it also works in this case from keeping them independent of both Sambia on one side and Cormier on the other side. Same thing with the High Dale, although they do it far less aggressively than, Ar than Arkendale. The folk of High Castle and their fellow High have maintained firm independence, aided by Cormierian support, which they've had for years, because Sambia, unlike Arkendale, where it's like, we're going to make you wish you'd never been born. <laughs> if, you, if you're a Sambian and you're attacking, you come up and say, it would be advisable of you to surrender. The Arkin would say to them, no, it would be advisable of you to run on home Yeah. before we take care of your children, your nieces, your nephews, all of whom we know exactly where they go to school, what their names are, and we're ready. Wow. So you better run home now. That's the Arkin way. The High Dalers did the other thing. They said, uh, <clears throat> Cormier, if you really value having the mountain passes open, you might want to um, send us arms and money and maybe a few of your soldiers now because <laughs> there's a Sembian army coming up the hill. And that, that happened over and over again, and it worked over and over again. So that's how the High Dalers took care of it. Yeah. Um, like Arkendale, they say they see Sembians the same way, rich, grasping folk, never to be trusted because, and here's the quote, a Sembian wants one thing from you, everything. <sighs> Oh, that's good. I would have used that. <laughs> no, that's okay. very good. Battle rise. Firmly Cormirian. Really? Village, yeah. Village yeah. on the way of the Manticore, dominated as ever by cooperages and wheelwrights and rival wagon works. It makes sense. It's 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 to the um it's to the west of the Dark Flow. So yeah. it, it would be, yeah. Yeah, that's where Cormir says this is the line in the sand. Yeah. And Symbia says, you don't want to tangle with us. We're rich. And Cormier replies, you don't want to tangle with us because we're noble and stupid. <laughs> Meaning, we'll kill you. <laughs> I had seen Battle Rise, at least in the story. And of course, this is a very unofficial. But, um, you know, I had seen Battle Rise as there was an east and there was a west, you know. And mm -hmm. so it kind of straddled, um, straddled the river. There was a gatehouse. Well, there is. As a, well, okay. Aside from all this stuff that is that is their daily bread and butter, which is making and repairing wagons, barrels, kegs, crates, and coffers. And they have drovers, paddocks, and caravan encampments. So everything's to do with the travel back and forth, the, the mercantile travel. Um, there is indeed a rise or cliff at Battle Rise. Mm -hmm. From its edge, and the high ground happens to be on the west, the Cormirian side. And then the drop off of the cliff is to the east. Uh, and from the edge of this, battle rise one can see a long way east along the road to sembia so cormir mm -hmm. maintains a military watch post a tiny garrison but mainly a watch post you know so they can go is that an army uh yeah. <laughs> send a fast rider and blow the war horns and hope, hope somebody gets here from suzale fast enough <laughs> yeah yeah wake up those lazy buggers in Walloon. we want to uh survive <laughs> yeah. and then scardale the other battleground, because here it's not Sembia facing off against Cormir. Here it's Sembia facing off against Zental Keep. And they fought over Scard to take over Scardale for so long and so persistently that anyone from either place, so anyone from Zental Keep, anyone from Sembia, is viewed with open suspicion in Scardale today. No conquest ever really occurred because. Everyone else, Hillsfar, Mullmaster, Callant, Raven's Bluff, various Dales, and even Cormier, kept little garrisons of their own folk in Scardale as local trade representatives and to hold back 
Zembia, and Zendel Keep. These remain, so Scardale's still a bustling melting pot neutral ground crossroads trading center. There you go. Wow. Well, I am farther off base than I ever could have imagined with a lot of these things, but what, what a fertile ground to write a story in. It's okay. Make the realms your own. But yeah, yeah when I'm detailing the realms, I'm always trying to give you maximum adventure possibilities, play possibilities. So there'll always yeah. be local disputes, little gaps, ambitious people trying to do things. And it's a good time to be there because it's ground zero and you're about to get ridden over. No. <laughs> well, I, I shared this with you before the podcast and I, and I want the listeners to hear it. Uh, the, in the epilogue, the, the dialogue between Siren and Sonia was inspired by what you just said about how there's always something going on, regardless of what's happening with your PCs. There is always something happening in the realms. And Siren says, Toril is smaller for me now, Sonia. Everywhere I look, I see movements on the edges. Sonia says, yes, I know what you mean. Even last night in the calm air, I knew that somewhere our very world was being threatened. And Siren says, it's a love-hate feeling for me. At any given time, there are a thousand adventures being created, and some of them have our names written in them. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. <laughs> and that is my homage and my thank you to Ed Greenwood and what he's always said about his realms. Hey, it's fun. This, this, this has kept me amused and entertained all my life well, since I was five years old, and it has now done the same for lots of gamers. And that is a great feeling. You know, you have other things, lots of other things going on um, other than just realms stuff. Could you tell us if you're able to what you're working on now? Where to start? Okay. Right now I am working on a, okay. I've just published a Fay book with Alex Cameron and Alan Patrick, the DMs guild, uh, Fay land of red wizards. You can get it as a hardcover. Looks like an official book. It's the second book I've done with Alex. I did the Border Kingdoms last year. Mm -hmm. I have a, a something I'm working on for DMs Guild that will probably come out uh, this summer called Volo's Guide to Orm Pur. And it's a single city um, south of Shirtaler, uh, north of Shirtaler, excuse me, on the uh, Shining uh, Coast, uh, south of the Border Kingdoms. And it's a somewhat eastern in feel. Um, culture. Uh, I, again, I don't do real world analogs, but this is the city of Saffron mm -hmm. and a, a trading port. So it's a single city and um, some of the people I'm working with uh, will be doing adventures set in it afterwards, but it will bring you a new city as a Volo's guide that you could use as a completely different campaign setting. Yeah. You um, so that's one thing. Um, totally outside D&D, &D, um, I work on lots of other things for lots of other people. And there's a gentleman in Quebec called Andrew Volkoskis, who created a Viking role-playing game called Fate of the Norns a couple decades ago. And it's a, it doesn't use dice. He uses runes. Ooh. And it's a fascinating game to play because... You can play it at three different levels of crunch or low crunch at the same gaming table with the same group at the same time. Meaning you can, you can be a, a non-gamer or a novice gamer who just says, my character wants to climb the wall. Okay, pull one of your runes from your bag. Okay, here's what happened. Or you can be placing runes and using their colors and their meanings to um, uh, uh, inform what you do in the game. Or you can do full-on crunch with all the rules, and, and the person next to you could be doing it at a different level with the Norn, or Dungeon Master, running them at the same time. Hmm. And if you, if you look at it on the uh, um, Pendlehaven website, the Fate of the Norns, um, you will see this gorgeous cover of Odin hanging down, head down on the tree with the spear through him. Sure. It, it is just gorgeous. So that's what that and doing conventions with him up in, in Toronto. Uh, we used to do lots of fan expos together. And because we're gamers, fellow gamers, Canadian, male, bearded, 
put them on a panel together. Uh, and, and so we got <laughs> to know each other. We got to be good friends. Well, we're now doing a product together called Auth Cleoth. Um, or if you speak modern Gaelic, you would say, oh, that should be Ah Cleoth or whatever. But the, part, the point is Gaelic has changed its pronunciation so many times through the centuries that we, you can pick anything you want. And if a modern Gaelic speaker says you're wrong, you just go <laughs> back at them because, no, I'm right. You're modern. And anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. in, in real world history, the Vikings in the 790s AD conquered Dublin or the, mm -hmm. what would become Dublin. They stayed until the 900s. We are giving you a fantasy city. Our version of Ath Cleath, um is different from the real one in a couple of ways. First of all, magic works, and the Fae are living in Ath Cleath alongside the humans. And um, Citric Swarin, the One Eyed King, who is a real historical figure, we've kept him alive about 40 years longer than he, than he survived in real life to clearly differentiate our version from reality. And Andrew and I together are designing a fantasy city in which every building is described and every building has at least one non-player character in it who lives there or works there and can be found there. And every character has a proclivity, a characteristic, and a dirty secret. And uh -huh. therefore, you know what they all look like, how they act, and how to role play them. And, and they're you probably all the... intertwined. Oh, yeah, because it's a yeah. city. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the wagons take the dung away from the chamber pots. And everything works. And you need the dirty secrets because there's social combat in this uh, game. Diplomacy, in other words. You don't have to fight. So if you want your your grandmother and aunties to play a game and they don't want any fighting or bloodshed that's fine you can play a fate of the norns game they can walk and talk and gossip and and sw and deceive each other and make friends and and band together and do things together and without ever drawing a weapon and the game rules are there for you to influence people that would be my gaming group that that's what we'd do we'd we just oh, walk good. around and you know gossip and <laughs> RP. And if you don't want to play Fate of the Norns and Vikings don't turn your crank, well, you're going to have to change a lot of the, the names in this because everything's authentic. So Vikings all have patronyms, matronyms, or nicknames, by names, like the Clumsy, the Horse Gelder, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so you're going to have to file off a lot of the Norse, Old Norse names. But other than that, you can use this fantasy city in any fantasy role-playing campaign so you can just drop it into your D, D campaign or you can drop it into your D, D campaign at random you can just have it you know one or two of the maps and booklets handy and then anytime somebody zigs and when they should have zagged in other words you're in Waterdeep, or you're in baldry's gate or you're in some other city and they say i'm going into that building over there instead of the dungeon master going oh geez because i don't have it detailed you just you just Lift up your adventure, stick your finger down at random on Athcleath, and go, oh, yes. And then you know exactly who's in the building and what it is because I've detailed every building in the city. Wow. You're going to save us a lot of work. Yeah, you could use it in anything. Now, this is a um, wagon load, a night soil wagon load of work. I mean, I it's been two years so far, and I'm still in the middle of city blocks detailing them. But I would imagine, <laughs> yeah, I am going to give you a city, and if you follow me on Twitter, you get to see news and gossip from the city every day, and you could just steal those as plot hooks. I wondered what those were. Yes. Well, I, I'm doing three things on Twitter every day. I'm telling the story of Lord Wolf, who is a fantasy of my own creation, not part of the realms or whatever, as he and uh, three countrymen um, wander through a palace, one of the countrymen being his king. Uh, and he is sort of Lord, a Machiavelli character. Um, so I'm doing that. And that's mainly for them to slang each other. And then I'm giving you some dog roll poetry every day, which is vaguely fantasy usually, and is usually a parody of some 
a tiny bit of a much better poem by someone far more famous that I'm just, you know, lampooning for fun. And then the third thing is, uh, meanwhile, in Athkleath, and it's your news and rumors from the city. And you can, like I said, you don't have to ever play in Athkleath. You can just say, oh, that's cool. I'll steal that. And that's what they'll be talking about in the tavern in my campaign the next time somebody goes in the tavern. That's cool. That's what that's what I'm I'm doing these things for fun. Gaming is fun for me. It would be really nice if somebody dropped several million dollars on me, but there doesn't seem to be any danger of anybody doing that. I haven't found the planet full of stupid people who will give me that much money. So I'm doing it for free and it's fun. <laughs> Well, we instead of money, your fans are dropping lots of love your way. Oh, sure. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's cool. That's what it's all about. So, so speaking of your fans, um, and uh, other than Twitter, um, where can we go to find out more information um, uh, from you and about you, uh, the the Mages and Sages podcast? Yeah, that that would be pretty much it. Um, Mages and Sages is run by uh, friends of mine, Jeff Thetford and Curry Russell, down in. Uh, uh, Florida. And uh, yeah, you will also find a lot of the lower lords of the realms, like Eric and George, for instance, sometimes Brian, but Eric and George fairly regularly will show up and be part of the uh, uh, panel there and we'll talk all sorts of stuff about the realms. So usually you'll get um, tons and tons of lore. Well, Ed, I've kept you an hour and a half um, and uh, I just... I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all of your work over the years. And thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure for both. It's It's been a great fun talk and I, I love doing the realms. And, and if it's been useful and fun and entertaining for anybody, you or anybody else, that's great because that makes it far more rewarding than most jobs I could think of having because, you know, I, I don't save the world. I, I can't save people. I'm not a doctor. You know, I can't do anything really worthwhile. But if I can lighten hearts, that's what it's all about. And if it's done that for you, hooray! It's a win. Well, only stories last forever. And you've, given, you've given us those yeah, in, in quantity. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Though this marks the end of the episode... The tale continues within a 10-day. Join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.